Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It's the Apostle Paul saying, If I preach the gospel, I have no reason to brag since I'm obligated to do it. If I'm in trouble, if I don't preach the gospel, if I do this voluntarily, I get rewarded for it. But if I'm forced to do it, then I've been charged with a responsibility. Well, what reward do I get? That's when I preach, I offer the good news free of charge. That's why I don't use the rights to which I'm entitled through the gospel. Although I'm free from all people, I make myself a slave to all people to recruit more of them. I act like a Jew to the Jews so I can recruit Jews. I act like I'm under the law to those under the law so I can recruit those who are under the law, though I myself am not under the law. I act like I'm outside the law to those who are outside the law so I can recruit those outside the law. Though I'm not outside the law of God, but rather under the law of Christ. I act weak to the weak so I can recruit the weak. I become all things to all people so I could save some by all means possible. All the things I do are for the sake of the gospel so I can be a partner with it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Most gracious and holy God, we thank you for the gift of today and of your, your spirit, which is moving in and through us. And I pray that you would uh, change our hearts, leave us a little bit different, a little bit closer to you. In Jesus name. Amen. Before I uh, start the message this morning, I had this memory that came up when I um, when Heather shared about my Bible content exam, and it has to do with Sue Ann, although, uh, you know, it, it's just indirectly related to Sue Ann. Uh, we, Sue Ann and I were both at the Q Christian Fellowship Conference, although Sue Ann was a, uh, a, a leader in it and, and led a session. And uh, one night we were playing this, this like trivia game. Uh, I forget what, what the website was called, but basically, uh, round one was uh, queer trivia, and, and it was about like queer American culture. Uh, and out of maybe 150 people, I don't mean to brag, but I was in like the top 20. Uh, at one point, I was number one. It didn't last for long, but I, I was really up there. Uh, and then the second round was Bible trivia. <clears throat> one would think as someone who is pastoring and in seminary and has a bachelor's in biblical studies that I uh, would do fairly well with, uh, with Bible trivia. And yet I would, out of like 150 people, I think I was in the seventies. Uh, so 
I have to tell you, I failed Bible trivia and it is a true miracle from God that I passed this Bible content exam. So uh, I'm just very, very grateful this morning. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, I think that it's uh, just kind of strange because in a, in certain church circles, the, the things about like Bible trivia, that's like the most important thing, right? It's the most important thing to know every fact in the Bible. It's this idea of faith being about certainty, um, about faith being entirely about what you know. Um, and if I'm being honest with you, uh, even as we read this passage today, I've got a lot of baggage surrounding it, right? When I saw that it, it came up in our lectionary for today, the lectionary is like a, a, a plan, like a, a preaching plan that a lot of churches use. Um, when I saw that this, this passage came up in the lectionary, I was just ready to choose something different uh, because I've got some evangelical experience in the past that affects how I read this passage. The form of faith that I gravitated towards when I was a teenager, um, it was one that equated faith with absolute certainty. Uh, so the object of faith was to know all that you can about God, to know all that you can about the Bible. And so I used to listen to long sermons on YouTube and I would take notes and my Bible was full of post-it notes and my pages were full of, of things that I had written uh, that gave the answer to what faith is, to what uh, Christianity is, to what the gospel is. And so then evangelism was telling people the good news. It was about telling people what they need to believe. I'm right and you're wrong. And here's the good news. If a tidal wave comes right now and we're both swept out to sea, I'm going to heaven. I hate to tell you, babe, you're going to hell. And then, you know, you can't leave people like that. You got to take them down the Romans road. Does anyone know what I'm talking about with the Romans road? The Romans road, you, you take a few different stops in the book of Romans. Uh, you stop one, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Stop two, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And, and you, you take a few different stops. And the idea is that you ask the right questions. You say the right verses so you could convince the other person what you know, what you're absolutely certain about, um, what you have some theological correctness about. Um, and the, the object of the game is to get them to subscribe to, to everything that you believe. And so that is the form of evangelism that I am most familiar with, that, that is my baggage that I bring to this, this passage. And I suspect I'm probably not the only one that has some baggage or has some, some you know, this, this passage might have felt a little bit weird. Probably some of you uh, didn't grow up in, in that sort of evangelism-centric form of faith. I imagine some of you uh, grew up with value, valuing religious diversity or um, perhaps some type of universalism where you respect all paths to the divine. And maybe that's where you are now. And so then a passage about Paul being a relentless recruiter for the gospel, doing whatever it takes to convince people of the gospel, to share the gospel message. Well, I imagine that probably doesn't resonate very well with you either. And so thinking about all of this, I wanted to choose a different text, but um, to be honest, I felt like it was one of those things where God was drawing me towards it, where, where God was, uh, I couldn't stop thinking about it. 
And so uh, I am wrestling with this and I invite you to wrestle as well and to wrestle with me, wrestle with God about what does sharing your faith look like? Like what, what, what does it mean to share the good news? What does it look like for, for the people in your life to, to hear you talk about your faith? How does faith shape your interactions? What might God be calling you to do for the sake of the gospel? I, I think these are important questions as we learn to live our faith Monday through Saturday so that our faith isn't just the Sunday thing. And what we do here on Sunday mornings is practicing. Like we're, we're practicing living out faith. We're practicing seeing things through Holy Spirit inspired imagination. We practice imagining what policies would help create a more just and equitable and anti-racist society. We practice identifying sin in ourselves, in society, and doing what Brooke invited us to do last week, lifting up the rock and revealing the slugs that have always been hiding there. We practice forgiveness. We practice for just an hour a week what living out Jesus's good news might look like every day. We practice what it, what it means for us to look at each other and say, you are loved and you are forgiven. And so maybe evangelism could be more about sharing this Jesus way of life that we practice together than it is about asking tricky questions to get someone down the Romans road. I had an experience that kind of shapes some of my thoughts on this. Um, before the pandemic, when I was living in Boston, I was helping my church reopen a youth group. Um, and, and they were like, oh, Brent, he's young. He can help with the youth group. And, uh, you know, my birth certificate age is pretty young. But uh, as soon as the, the teenagers started, like, coming in the doors, like, I was ready to find my retirement community. Uh, and uh, and. My church in Boston, there's quite a bit of violence in the neighborhood. There's police brutality, there's some gang violence. And so there's a lot of things that make it unsafe. Uh, and our goal was to create a program just where teenagers could be safe on a Friday night, um, which is a very different goal than uh, like my evangelical youth group where, where we were focused on telling teenagers what to believe. And so one week, this teenager came up to me and, and he said a slur. Uh, I just want to prepare you. He asked me, are you a faggot? And I, I got to tell you, I was truly shocked when he said that. Like I prepared for a lot of things, but I was not prepared for that. And so I just said, excuse me? And he said, do you like guys? Yes. Do you like girls? Yes do you like me? And then I said, no, you're like 12 years old. And then he stopped me and he said, wow, that was really offensive. You need to apologize for that. And I was like, I'm sorry. Are what, are you 14, 14? And he said, yes. And I was like, I, I am so sorry that I called you 12 when you are in fact 14. And and he responded, it's all good, man. Come here, give me a hug. Which, you know, it's just, it's just a lot going on, right? It's a truly bizarre experience. And he stayed after youth group ended, he helped us clean up. And then we had like a reflection period about how the night went. And then, um, then we started planning for the next week. Um, I was a little bit shocked that he even stayed because he, he didn't seem like he was enjoying it at all. Um, and, and uh, actually his, his one reflection was, you guys need to make sure we don't cuss. And I was like, that's just a, a very strange, strange thing that's happening. Um, and if I, if I were to judge that youth group by the criteria of sharing the gospel through 
absolute certainty and the Romans road, then there wasn't much evangelism happening that night. Um, and and I, I really wrestled with that um, because it was very different than, than my background. And, and so I talked to the pastor who was running the program and, and she helped me understand things in a different way. She, she shared with me that when someone lives with violence, the good news looks like a, pl a safe place to spend the, a Friday night. It looks like a land flowing with pizza and games, with milk and honey. When someone is inundated with society's sinful homophobia and queer antagonism, good news looks like LGBTQ affirmation. When someone doesn't experience healthy conflict in their life, good news looks like apologizing to them for calling them 12 instead of 14. Good news maybe doesn't look like the Romans road or absolute certainty, but good news looks like meeting people where they're at. I believe he experienced the gospel that night because I know I did. And so what would it look like for you where you are with the people that you interact with to share this Jesus way? May God be in our wrestling, amen. And so we now turn to uh, one another. This is a time where people share. We spend about 10 or 15 minutes sharing with each other what, uh, how this message is working in us what we feel like God is saying. And so again, anyone is invited to participate as much or as little as you'd like, uh, who'd like to go first. Uh, Anne. Thank you, Brent. Um, when I hear this passage uh, from Paul, I think, of him being pretending to be like everybody. Um, oh, okay, for the Jews, I'm gonna be a Jew for, you know, um, so pretending to be. But I also hear it as um, empathy. I'm gonna put myself in their, in their place. Um, and I guess where I wrestle with this is people who are Trumpers. <laughs> Um, people who are real right wing politically and um, so I God has put someone in my path down the street from me um, who we've met around my dog <laughs> and so this neighbor you know, has interacted with me over my dog. And the second time he stopped and was engaging me about the dog, you know, we talked for a while and I realized he had a Trump hat on. <laughs> this is before the election too. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I went away from that thinking, oh gosh, you know, he's a really nice guy and he wears a Trump hat. <laughs> And then um, it is not to say that I don't know people who were Trump supporters, who are ardent Republicans, um, who, you know, that I can't like or believe that God loves. <laughs> but, um, but at times I've wondered how to talk to people like this. And so it's been a beautiful way that God has worked in my life. Um, this, then uh, I was walking down, I was walking Wesley down the street about a month later, I guess this is after the election maybe. And I noticed um, some of the Trump flags in our neighborhood had come down, but he had this huge Trump uh, uh, banner inside his garage. And, um, and I was just thought, oh my gosh, you know, it, I'm, Cause some people after the election took it down, took their things down, but um, you know the election the, was was kind of undecided and going on and on. 
Um, and then more, uh, recently I took them some cookies. And um, anyway, we had this friendship going. Oh, and by the way, I, <laughs> I, I finally took it down yesterday, but I had an STD sign in my front door, stop the Donald. <laughs> And then I have a Biden Harris in my front window. They're small and I haven't taken it down quite yet. I'm still enjoying hearing President Biden on the news each day. But, um, but we had this relationship going without even talking about politics. And I'm, I'm hoping that someday we can maybe bridge that. Um, so sorry to just kind of go on and on, but but I feel God calling, trying to help me uh, figure out how to stand beside people who are on a different political um, persuasion as I. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah, I think I I'm similarly wrestling with that question. So, uh, Judy, I'll, I'll come to you next. But that while it's fresh in my mind, um, you know, uh, my. People that I'm very close to, we have very different political ideology. Um, and so conversations are so difficult, especially in a polarized time. Um, I, I think uh, someone shared something about this at our board meeting that they were surprised to find out someone had, you know, believed in 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 something. And, and I was like, yes, we we never know what other people actually believe unless we ask and listen. Um, and then, you know, my, my thought is, as I am in a journey of learning to ask and listen and love across difference, they are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. and they're learning to love me across difference and learning mm -hmm. to, to have some kind of grace for me when I say something that they politically disagree with. Um, which is just so much harder, um, you know? And, and, and yeah, I mean, maybe my journey of learning how to love and to, to have good news in community with, with people that are different, uh, they're, they're engaged in that same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and let's go to Judy and then Peter. I, I was just thinking about how, when I was young, I had a, a vision of what I thought um, Jesus looked like, who, who I was taught that Jesus looked like. And, and as the years passed and I got older and got involved in different things, I realized that actually my viewpoint of who Jesus was and who he looked like or she looked like was changing all the time. I, I remember thinking that if I was going to be a Christian in this world, I had to look at other people as they were Jesus, that I was looking into the eyes of someone else that was Jesus. A long, long time ago, I was an Al team sponsor for um, children of alcoholics. And I remember thinking to myself, I saw more of Jesus in these children and these young people than I did in any of the, the ministers or people who taught me about Jesus as I was growing up and, and in, through my life. And then when I was involved with uh, women that were abused, um, the same thing. I, I, met, I met ladies who, when they were young, slept in dryers because they, they left home to get away from uh, abuse in their homes. And I saw Jesus in their, in their faces and in their hearts. And I had that connection to people through that. So for me today, it's the same thing. When, when, when there's people who are struggling or, or, or hurting or just um, scared in this world, I, I feel like I see Jesus in them. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being the good news, Judy. Uh, Peter. Uh, yes, um, I, I was thinking about the passage itself and about what also what you were saying. 
that I, I think what I get out of the passage is the necessity of finding common ground uh, with anyone that we would meet or try to persuade to our faith or to anything else. You cannot do any of that unless you have established some common ground. And uh, it may be, and I think for a lot of people, that common ground is when they're walking their dogs and people make comments about the dog <laughs> and that you share the beauty of the dog. <laughs> and that is establishing common ground, which is the beginning of a relationship. And you cannot persuade anyone to your faith unless you begin with in a common place. Um, that's something that you share together and then you might move gently to the next stage. And uh, it seems to me that that's what Paul was doing, trying to evangelize people who were Jews and he had been a Jew uh, to Christianity. He'd have to embrace some dimensions of their Judaism um, if before they would trust him to go forward. And, and that's where the freedom of the gospel comes in. We are not bound by any particular thing except by Jesus and the openness of Jesus and of God uh, to everything that is. And so that becomes the common ground from which we can uh, take off. Mm. So thank you, Brett, for introducing this subject, which is a very important subject, I think, in our faith. Mm. Thank you, Peter. Does anyone else have any thoughts or reflections? Uh, Liz, and you'll just uh, need to hit the unmute button. So I don't, I, this might be all over the place. I have a couple of things, but um, when Judy was talking, I was just thinking about um, my life and I am, I'm somebody who comes from um, a background of, I struggled with addiction for a, a while, a long time in my early teenage years up into my young adulthood. Um, and I struggled with an eating disorder for a long time. And so, God and faith for me during all of that was a little bit of a, a difficult concept for me to grasp. I, just, I struggled a lot with that. And growing up, my grandmother, um, she was very involved with the church. And I, um, the thing that I found most sacred when I was doing church things with her was the music. I was always really involved and into the music and choir and she played the bells and she was just she was like the music person at church and um she went to school for music and that was really the only thing that I could relate to growing up with church and then when I started struggling with addiction and I was doing programs and recovering and involved with that I realized that faith didn't have to be all about what you know from the bible like you were talking about before or you know, what scriptures you can recite by, from your head, it, it was something that lived within myself. And that whatever God was, or, or, you know, faith was, it, it was living in me, and I had to trust that and have faith in that and in, in me and in myself as a person to move forward and to grow. And in addition to that, um, when Brent was talking to, I was thinking about um, how he was saying that it's important to have space for where other people are and where they're at. And I've realized too, for we were with my mother and her partner uh, for New Year's and we were talking about New Year's resolutions and mine was um, to have more patience for myself and where I'm at and to not be afraid to ask for help when I need it. Um, and in doing that, I realized that um, not only is it easier for me to exist and with myself and do better as a person for me, but I can have um, more space for other people and where they're at um, 
while I'm being more gentle with where I'm at. And I was always a person who prided myself on being open with people and being there for people. But I've realized in um, having more respect and space for where, where I am in my current place in life, I'm more able to be there for others as well. So I'm just grateful for that and um, for where I'm at today. Mm, amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, are there any, is there anyone else? Oh yeah, I was gonna um, just say that uh, when you mentioned the, you know, the incident with the little boy um, at the, after uh, the uh, event, um, you know, of course your immediate reaction is kind of like this, you know, like you're taken aback and just kind of like, you know, bad taste in your mouth. Um, it just kind of reminded me how like, I think there's a lot of people from like where my parents grew up and their generation and just like young kids who, um, you know, use term like use like slurs like that like to be offensive but then even when they're like not trying to be offensive it's almost like no one ever like clued them in on like hey that's not appropriate and it's easy to like get caught up in the fact that it was like um it is an offensive term and so you know but it's always like that you did a great job and admire like kind of like admiring that there was more to the moment than this and that it didn't have to like completely wash away you trying to, you know, take an opportunity to have a good influence, you know, on um, this kid. And like, of course we can always like still like correct them. But I think it was just like a reminder of like those times where it, it's easy to get stuck in a moment instead of just kind of taking a step back and going, you know what, this kid probably just hasn't been, you know, taught or mind like, hey, that's not an appropriate term. There are other appropriate terms for what you are, you know, trying to refer to, um, but that's not, you know, the appropriate term. Um, but, you know, I was, it's just like a reminder, like sometimes like people, you have to like rem remember like people's, you know, depending on where they grew up or like who they're around, like that's just how they, um, like what they learned, even when they're not necessarily trying to be disrespectful um and to kind of take those moments especially with, with kids like with grace and um and remember that there's more to them than just this you know air and to not let that like just wash away all that could be done in this you know moment you have the opportunity to either like you know get frustrated and let that affect how you engaged you know with him or you could take that opportunity to still engage properly with him and I'm sure that like he'll remember you you know from there on um and even just what you were saying about um like talking about kind of growing up in evangelicalism and uh I always had like this underlying thing of like wow we're really like taking it very seriously when people don't you know think or <laughs> or believe exactly the way we do and always have like this underlying discomfort with that but then not really realizing that there were other people who had that underlying discomfort until I got older and heard, you know, and read more things and, you know, you know, got, uh, you know, involved with other people. And then it was kind of like, oh, okay, so I wasn't the only one, like, feeling this way. Um, and so it's just, I don't know, it's interesting, like, the things that you look back on, you're like, yeah, I, that never really quite sat right with me, the kind of the, the need to make, you know, uh, people see things exactly the way that I do in the faith. And, um, and the freedom that came with realizing, oh, okay, there was other people who, who had noticed this as well. And I don't have to feel bad or like I'm, I'm in like dirty waters simply for not wanting to, um, <laughs> you know, deem it extremely, you know, um, unacceptable <laughs> for people to like not think exactly the way that I do. So. Thank you, Alicia. Anyone else? Uh, Daniel. Hello, everyone. I'd like to share something that you can interpret as you will, but something that I'm having a hard time ignoring from the excerpt that you were, um, you spoke about today from Corinthians. And uh, you mentioned early that 
it wasn't necessarily a, a passage that you were excited to speak to and that it was something that you wrestled with, but you felt a sense of obligation to, to share with us today. And for us, joining your service and worshiping with everyone this morning was, um, you know, something that we had thought about doing. And I thought it was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe coincidental. I don't want to speak on behalf of God, but um, I actually am, I come from a Jewish background and um, being part of church is something that is new to me. And so for you to speak a passage that you were unsure about whether or not you wanted to share and have it be about, um, you know, Paul speaking to the Jews and becoming that and me seeing all the similarities between the service today and something that I'm more traditionally used to having in my life was really coincidental. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't share that um, maybe there is another reason that you were, um, you know, supposed to share that today. So I just I wanted to share with everyone. Thank you, Daniel. Uh... Wow, thank you for, for bringing us into your story. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> of course, of course. Wow. Anyone else? If not, uh, we are uh, gonna move into our, our next song, which is uh, Lord Prepare Me to Be a Sanctuary. And um, while, while we're in this song, I wanna invite you to grab something for communion, to grab something to eat, something to drink, and we'll go into communion after that. Uh, Sue Ann. Um, yeah, since I get a little opportunity to intro this song, I'll also share my thoughts as well. Um, what does it mean to preach the gospel? What does it mean to share the good news? This is um, something that came up in my Bible study a few weeks ago, and um, I was like, well, if the gospel means good news, like, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be just like, you don't have to go to hell, right? Like there's lots of other kinds of good news that Jesus brings with us. And, um, and I think that like sharing those is also a way that we evangelize, right? Or we share what the good things, uh, the blessings that God has given us. Um, I, you know, this song we're about to sing called Sanctuary, um, I, one thing I love about it is that uh, it reminds us that each of us, um, we're made in the image of God, and because of that, um, the Spirit of God is within us, and that we are a sanctuary, right, for that Spirit, um, that we don't have to go to a church building, that <laughs> we can uh, make a safe, sacred, right, by bringing the Spirit of God into it, and also, like, honoring that in other people. And I think um, it's in a time of COVID when like, you know, you can't necessarily meet in like the physical sanctuary space, right? It's a, it's a great reminder and it's an encouragement to remember that, um, that the sanctuary is not because of the building, the sanctuary is because of the presence of God, right? Which is everywhere with us. Um, and so I think like a lot of times we think that we have to take the good things about God and we have to like go out and spread it into the world without realizing how God is already near and close to us or walking with us through whatever is happening. So um, that the peace that Jesus promises isn't a conquering peace, right? It isn't to go and make everyone like us or to, um, to like unify under one sort of like imperial vision the way that the Roman Empire does but rather that like the peace of Christ is, is subversive to the powers of the world. And, and then that like the greatest gift that God gave us was to have, um, like we say this, this is what we say in my Bible study, just this was that woman, Tongzai, like that Jesus's presence is like body and presence is like with us. So we're going to um, sing this song both in English and in Mandarin, and you can sing. Um, I'm we're gonna I'm gonna alternate between both. Um, you're welcome to try or sing whatever you're most comfortable with, but um, I included the pinging as well. So, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Give 
sanctuary that that God brings us to uh, we now start our time of communion where we're brought together and so I invite you to join me in our prayer of confession merciful God we confess to you and to our siblings in Christ that we have sinned in our thoughts and our words and what we have done and what we have failed to do we come to you Lord asking for forgiveness. My friends, hear the good news, the good news that, uh, that you have the opportunity to live out. God loves you. God forgives you. You are loved. You are forgiven. Join with me now. We are all loved. We are all forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. All right, Anne, you want to take it from here? Sure. Friends, we come to this uh, Holy Communion knowing that it is uh, God who invites us, who reminds us that we are all made in God's image and that we all have the spirit of God within us. It is the table of Christ and Christ invites all who hunger and thirst for love, acceptance, community, forgiveness, grace, to join in this feast of grace. My daughter was laughing last night when I was telling her about uh, how Wesley, you know, is so good and in my dog and enjoys um, worship with me and how he has communion. So those of you who have furry animals, I hope you have a piece of communion for them. 
So in whatever language or words are most familiar to you, let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught his followers, his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so we remember the story. Jesus was at table with his disciples. It was the Seder. They were uh, celebrating God's um, deliverance of God's people from Egypt. And uh, so on the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread and the unleavened bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup Perhaps it was the cup of Elijah, and he gave it new meaning, saying, This cup is God's new covenant. Drink from it to remember me. So wherever you are this morning, with whatever elements you may have, may Christ meet you in this sacred communion. Come, receive, eat, and drink. Christ is with us all. Amen. Amen. And now let's join together in one last song. Uh, and let me get make sure the lyrics are up. Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
gladly for I we adore you. Amen, amen. My friends, this week and always Monday through Saturday, we will encounter people who are different from us, people who are hurting differently from us, people who believe different things, who vote different ways, people who, uh, who are, are struggling to love us as we love them. And may we find that common ground, may we find the dog walking, uh, may we find the good news that there is love, there is peace, there is hope, there is forgiveness. May we participate with God in the gospel for all people this day and always. Amen. Go in peace, my friends.